So hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. On behalf of the Standards for Earth Observations GRSS Technical Committee, I'm glad to welcome Dr. Michael Koch, who will give a talk about good practices for land product validation. He's a research hydrologist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service, Hydrology and Remote Sensing Laboratory. And uh, we are uh, open for the webinar. Um, so if you have any uh, questions, you can use the chat box or just ask and we will unmute you right after the webinar. So without further ado, Dr. Michael, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, I'll be going over the, the work of many, many people here, so I don't even have any name listed at the front of this, but my name is Mike Kosh with the uh, Ag Research Service here. I work in Beltsville, Maryland uh, in the US, and uh, I'm currently serving as the chair of the Land Product Validation Subgroup, um, along with uh, my colleagues Fabrizio Nero, co-chair, and our secretary, uh, Jamie Nickerson, who works out of Goddard uh, Space Flight Center. So I'm here for the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, uh, CIOS, for those uh, familiar with acronyms. We're gonna have a lot of acronyms today. Uh, and they have a working group on CalVal or WGCV. Uh, and within that, there are several other subgroups and land product validation subgroup is, is what I'll be speaking about today. Uh, I said I had a lot of uh, acronyms. Uh, here's where they start. Uh, Everybody hopefully is familiar with GEO or GEOS, uh, the Group on Earth Observations, uh, Global Earth Observing System of Systems. Always love it when there's System of Systems or Committee on Committees. Um, but the, that is kind of the uh, start for a lot of this. There's lots of G7, G8 uh, discussions that led to the formation of these different groups. There are a little bit of overlapping, um, but in the lower right hand corner, you can see where um, we have WGCV. Uh, has SAR, TMSG, ACSG down at the bottom is land product validation, where we report to various groups as well with GOFC and GTOS. Um, but within our group, we have 10 current uh, focus areas uh, listed there, land covered by a physical. And I'll go into more detail on them in a, in a minute. But this is the larger structure that we try to have as a community, uh, international community for standards of land products. And our mission is uh, the uh, coordinate the, the quantitative validation of satellite draft products focused license on standardization and comparison and validation across products from different satellite algorithms and agency sources. So we all worry about having, say, soil moisture or burned area or land surface temperature, but we have them from different platforms. We have them from different agencies, different measurements, uh, trying to bring them together. So when, when we talk about the actual essential climate variable, for instance, or the essential agricultural variable, we all have the same language, uh, which is very important because we as scientists need to communicate with the public, and communicating with the public uh, while not contradicting each other because we as scientists dig deeper into the meaning uh, definition of the terms we're using. The public doesn't always see it that way and you can get a lot of confusion on their part. And once you have a confused public, you often have one chance uh, to make to make your point. And if they don't believe you, they probably never will. So uh, this, this work behind the scenes to make everything seem uh, cohesive, understandable, and trustworthy is, is one of our main goals uh, to, to bring that together. So here are focus areas we'll talk about today. We have an uh, initiative to bring on a few more of these as more missions are launched and more uh, efforts are made uh, to have value-added products generated from even the basic uh, methods that are the basic variables that are collected. Um, but biophysical, fire, burned area, these are broad categories and we kind of dig in a little bit on how they're monitored um, and then there are different measurements within those that can get their own uh, special treatment. Um, the phenology, vegetation, that's land cover, snow cover. Um, consider that uh, SWE or fractional cover, very different measurements, um, treated separately, but still under the snow cover. Uh, surface, rough, surface radiation, soil moisture, land surface temperature, and even emissivity, and above ground biomass, 
above ground biomass in this instance is generally woody above ground biomass, forests, inventories, things like that. Here is our web page. You can find us easily by searching for LPV, CIOS uh, LPV. Uh, we are housed on a web server at Goddard Space Flight Center, so I usually get there from GSFC LPV, and I get it right away. Um, but you have this QR link right there if you want to navigate to it later. Again, I'm a, the current chair. We do three-year terms. So I was three years as vice chair, three years as chair. And Fabrizio Nero out of Circo, uh, Ezrin in Frascati, Italy is the vice chair and he'll um, rotate in in 2026, I believe. Uh, and secretary is Jamie Nickerson, who works out of Goddard. Uh, everyone else I'll speak of is uh, what we would call a best efforts a volunteer in this organization. We receive no funding. Uh, generally, there are certain projects that might receive some funding, but the, the people involved here are are contributing their time as a part of their job or outside of their job to, to make this thing work. So we're dedicated and committed, but often overworked. Uh, so please uh, forgive our late email, our uh, long delayed email returns. Um, if you ask us a question, we're trying to get uh, better support for the, these efforts. And, and you'll see how some of that is working very well, uh, but there's still a, a bit of room to go. I hear those folks I speak of, and I'll be showing a lot of their slides that they've provided to us. Um, in the more most recent meeting we've had, here we have our land product, our land products on the left, and then our um, focus area leads uh, next to them. We try to have a mix of at least two focus area leads, one from North America and one from Europe. Uh, we have various uh, adjustments to that, uh, depending on the cycle. Most people work a three years, two, three year cycles, um, and then they rotate off and we bring on new folks. This is uh, ideal for uh, mid-career people, uh, enough to know the community, but not so much that they're um, overworked. They're, they're still trying to build their career here, although we have some senior folks on this list. Um, it, it is a bit of a, a work. It is a bit of a labor um, to, to corral the community together. You need to know the ins and the outs of what's going on, um, but it's also a way to improve your understanding of the community in which you work. Uh, I myself had started in the soil moisture community. Um, at, once I moved up uh, to the vice chair position, John Bolton took over for me from uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And Alex Gruber recently took over for um, Karsten Monska in soil moisture. We've had the unfortunate um, luck recently of having several folks pass away, um, something that I usually don't have to, to deal with uh, in my everyday life, but um, we, we've had a string of bad luck with our, with our focus area leads. So lots of people have to step in at the last moment to to serve um, with with a little overlap. And I thank each and every one of these folks for uh, committing a lot of time and resources and effort to get this uh, effort moving as well as it has been. So what are we doing? Overall, we're we're trying to create a framework. We we don't want to have our hand on the wheel the entire time. We'd like to make things automated as possible. We work towards and what we call basically operational validation. Once a product's flying, once the satellite's flying, we have products uh, being collected and generated. We'd love it if they could be done uh, and evaluated almost uh, automatically. That is what we call the level four, and you'll see that matrix in a minute. Um, but we start with unverified satellite data. This is something that's usually not measuring the actual uh, variable we're interested in. It's measuring a proxy or something that has a good analog or high correlation. And then we try and turn that into a validated product. We like to use fiducial reference measurements, uh, data that we have trust in that's measured at the ground often. Uh, we don't like to rely on purely modeled products when, when we can get it to actual surface measurements. So we have some sense of reality. We do that by using good practices documents uh, so that we have uh, Many, no one person can generate all of the data necessary to validate a satellite. We have to have a community 
each contributing and we'd like to have them all using similar practices or as similar as possible so that we have when, when we have to trace errors in our products that are produced we can we can trust that the reference data is um based in the in the common um, in a common framework so that if there is an issue we can trace back uh, and not have to find this it you know it's bad in this location because they do it a different way and what's really the influence on the overall validated product um, we'd like it to have an online validation tool and then an comparison report uh, and we have several we have an example or two of how that can be done again here is our focus areas and i mentioned those good practice and protocols uh, we've had some published in the past we have actually quite a few of them in process right now uh, starting in 2014, the biophysical produced an LAI, good practice product. Um, that That is our first. And then in 2019, 2020, um, we had land surface temperature and albedo being produced. Then above ground woody biomass, AGWB, 2021, and soil moisture in 2020. Uh, these things are living documents. Once they go out, they uh, are published on our website at the LPV website and we try and update them. We're looking at some updates right now <clears throat> to some of these documents. As new information comes forward, <clears throat> new satellites are launched or new um, subjects are introduced, such as artificial intelligence. Excuse me one second. Sorry about that. We're targeting in 2024. Uh, uh, documents in burned area, phenology, vegetation index, and land cover. Uh, several of these are very well underway or, or close to 90% complete. And uh, we'll go into that in a minute. Another thing that we like to identify is that's 10 different um, focus areas. And it would be useful if when communicating, uh, we have lots, lots of interplay between these different variables. Ideally, the places that we reference uh, would be able to have common resources and produce uh, all of the variables to some uh, fiducial level so that when we want to make uh, inferences about the impacts of one measurement on another measurement, we'd be able to do that, which would require all of the measurements to be made at a particular site. So we call these LPV super sites. These are not supported by LPV, but recognized as uh, outstanding sites that collect these measurements, uh, multiple measurements that are within the land product validation subgroup uh, to a sufficient standard uh, that are reliable, accurate, and informative. So we have TURN, uh, NEON, the, uh, ICOS among, the, uh, among these, LTER, uh, long-term ecosystem research sites in the US. Not every site uh, among these networks would be a, a super site. Some of them are, are still limited but uh, these are currently recognized and we're due for a review of these again to see what is, um, if there are any additional sites that came online that would provide valuable reference sites uh, for a subset of, of focus area land products. Part of the effort, and, and if you go back to that um, acronym heavy page, uh, the community, especially the European community has come forward with um, ways of uh, providing quality assurance frameworks for Earth observations or fiducial reference measurements for Earth observations, FRM for EO. These uh, efforts are producing CalVal portals where data for specific land products can be uploaded and reference uh, re and reports can be produced easily. Uh, if you have a new product that you've produced from a set of satellites, you can upload your data set and get a report back out. Um, all of these frameworks are trying to to match each other and start talking with um, with action agencies that want to produce or use this data for decision making. And decisions actually have pretty significant results usually. Uh, so we want to know that the data going in is val valid and reasonable and traceable. Because if there are decisions being made that can affect uh, the economy, can affect life and death, we do want to have a, a way to trace back and prove that these were made with the best of intentions to some level of accuracy. 
maybe not perfect, but some measurable level of accuracy so that there's the most information available on uh, so that decision makers can keep that in mind when making their decisions. I'm going to dig into a couple of the focus areas now so we can see uh, how they start developing, uh, their how they progress with their work over the years. Here is an outline for the Vegetation Indices Good Practices Protocol. This is how it starts. Uh, a group forms, they start discussing uh, what needs to go in there, a description of the validation stages, which I have left out, um, and the definitions, having everybody use the same verbiage, which can be difficult sometimes, uh, and then go into what are the resources available, how are these done, what are the different ways this, the sensors are these sensors are calibrated and how these are used um, versus ground data. <clears throat> for the land cover, for instance, we have a 90% ready draft uh, just sent out to the co-authors for a final review before it's shared with the larger community to get feedback. There are multiple rounds of, of feedback and then a final approval from the LPV and WGC groups um, to really get a good breadth of, of response and review um, because getting that first document out is is quite time consuming it takes multiple years um, but we work from that point on uh, and updating is a little bit easier uh, as new information comes you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time for above ground biomass another thing that we do is support workshops uh, and and work towards having community workshops where uh, experts can come together and uh, produce uh, and, and kind of bring their minds together on one focused area. And uh, you see here a biomass experts workshop in March of uh, 2024, <clears throat> the University of Maryland USGS Sil Silver Carbon Program uh, proposed a meeting with the above ground biomass group, uh, the IPCC and the stakeholder countries to integrate these maps of the national reporting. So these come through a variety of grants, uh, the NASA Carbon Monitoring uh, Carbon Monitoring Program uh, 2023 grant helps support this. It's up to the workshop organizers to really track down this funding to make everything happen, which is again another uh, commendable thing. There, we wish there were a pot of money available to do this work, but it's it's just not there. For soil moisture, the cross community workshop. Uh, recently in uh, Bern, Switzerland, we're trying to have one every other year at least, and, and some communities are able to support a little bit more, uh, maybe have annual meetings, um, but a remote sensing and climatology for essential climate variables and their uncertainties was convened in November of 2023. And uh, the, the latest uh, issue with soil moisture, for instance, is the resolution which data is captured and validated. Most of the products within soil moisture were on the order of 30 kilometers, 25 to 40 kilometers, depending on your satellite. Even with rescaling and downscaling, we're now um, using a lot of models and assimilation, but uh, we didn't have a way of truly uh, independently assessing that. Now with the NISAR mission coming online soon, we will have field scale products on the 200 meter resolution. That is a new problem for us. Uh, in the soil moisture community that we haven't dealt with yet. And there are uh, theories or uh, methodologies that are under development and starting to be proved about how to do these small scale uh, resolution validations, uh, which require a lot of work on the ground, um, especially when you're trying to do the breadth of um, landscapes that we do want to capture with that. So this is one of the problems uh, currently being addressed by the soil moisture community. There's also been a lot of work from the European side on the uh, bringing together the data sets necessary, the judicial reference measurements for soil moisture. The International Soil Moisture Network began over 10 years ago uh, out of the Vienna Technical University to bring together the available public data for uh, sing it organize the data into a common format across the many available networks to produce something that would be easily ingested into someone's validation system, and then they could produce out reports on their own. Uh, this is an integral part of a, of a uh, quality assurance system or 
for fiducial reference measurement system, uh, ultimately getting us to a, a level four product, um, which is a fully validated automated system of producing land product and having evaluated on a common platform. Vegetation in the seas, um, uh, which is sometimes difficult to, to parse between a uh, biophysical measurement of vegetation in the sea or some of the other measurements, uh, our focus areas uh, have protocol under development. Uh, they formed a small group of experts to review the outline. They're in the process. Uh, they had a kickoff meeting over a year ago, um, revised the outline, started complete first drafts. Um, December 3rd, they completed their first draft and they're having a review. And then we'll send out to a larger community after that so that everybody is recognized for their work as well as capturing all the different aspects that need to be captured in those good practices documents. One point is that good practices documents versus best practices documents, we've, we've adopted the phrasing good practices because there are still discrepancies uh, within the communities and using good practices that recognizes that not, there's not a one size fit all approach um, because sometimes your work uh, and the products being used do depend upon the app, uh, differ between the applications for which those products are used. Uh, so good practices uh, can still be tailored to the specific application that say a network or a product is being produced for, even though it's soil moisture or veget a vegetation index, it might have a particular application that we're targeting. And we want to make sure that we're being fair to that product and not holding it to a standard that's too um, too rigorous um, when it does meet its, say, for instance, funded target. Um, you know, it meets the funded target, um, though it isn't useful for everyone. We still have those situations because we're not fully um, funded as an earth observation community. Uh, land cover draft this, uh, they held a meeting in the fall of last year in Beltsville, and they brought together a large group of international uh, collaborators to discuss how to accurately assess land cover. Um, I, I have here a 90% ready draft. It's probably uh, 95 to 99% um, complete and ready to go out to the larger community for, for review. They have lots, they've had lots of progress here, and you'll see the number of names uh, sprinkled throughout this. Uh, there, there's a significant amount of work in this. And land cover, you think, would be something. Um, there's lots of evolution to this over time. And there's still, I was at this meeting, and it was quite interesting to see the diversity of opinions uh, expressed and, and trying to bring that into one common uh, discussion well, it was quite the challenge. For instance, here are the products that are available for land cover. Uh, it, it is difficult to make sense of all of these, especially as a novice coming in. If you just didn't, if you just want a land cover map, um, we're trying to address the needs as the Caval community to verify all of these different products that are produced. And as a user, you want to have an understanding of what the accuracy is of each of these, um, so that for your particular use, you can go forward and. Uh, just move on with your own research. Um, so th this is quite a task, knowing the different uh, categories that can be available within each of these, and then how would you validate them, and how is the definition of each of these land covers uh, made by, say, their fiduciary reference measurements uh, sites or, or surveys, um, and matching them up can be quite a task. It's, non, it's a categorical, non-quantitative, um, so even more of a particular challenge. Um, we try to keep these lists updated for each of our focus areas, uh, and often they are just always growing, and it is uh, a never-ending uh, task to keep these updated as also those websites and uh, column K here. The data link uh, constantly can change as servers are rerouted um, and things renamed uh, and re-archived or moved to a different data archive. Uh, so very difficult to keep this up to date. Um, we do our best. And there's, uh, I always point to our LVP, LV, LPV website um, as the first place to go when you want to see, well, what is out there uh, for a particular land product? Uh, these are tend to be the most curated online um, from my experience, uh, but still not perfect. 
uh, biophysical. Uh, I'm going to show a, a series of slides here how we address the super sites and how a, a land product can be assessed against different land uh, fiducial reference measurements of super sites. They're also developing code with that cover pie. Um, the code archives, GitHub here, uh, are one of those ways in which we can kind of unburden ourselves with trying to find funding to keep a, a reference system or an online Calval portal going. Um, if the code is available for someone else to implement at their own location, we are almost meeting our goal of having a common community standard being available to every person uh, wishing to use these data. Uh, if you have that that toolbox available, people can incorporate as they wish, uh, as long as they produce a, a common pro a common reference uh, report. Um, we're still satisfying our goal of having uh, easily validated products. So, uh, grounded earth observation, grounded earth observation progress presented uh, at the recent joint ECESA Earth System Science Workshop. Here are the NEON sites, uh, each of these four letter acronyms, BART, JORN, so JORN is Hornada, DSNY is actually Disney, it's the Orlando site uh, in the U.S., um, Circus Smithsonian here in Maryland. These sites were evaluated for the biophysical products. Um, here it's um, PAI, Plan Area Index. Um, these are just at the NEON sites. Then you can in more neon sites, and then the ICO sites, and then the turn sites in Australia. We're able to, to quickly compare and assess um, versus all of these networks. So that, that is our ultimate goal, an example from biophysical. Land surface temperature and emissivity. I uh, hear a list of some conferences. We always try and highlight the conferences that are available um, for each individual focus area, not capture, not 100% but, but uh, best effort to get those fully um, advertised uh, through our newsletters and um, through our presentations. Uh, lots of effort to get LST. Um, although th there's probably one of the longer term data records out there, um, but also one of the more dynamic and, and ever changing um, and very challenging when it comes to new platforms to make sure that the archive can be harmonized across um, all of these different measurements. A new satellites, the SBG mission um, has a component in phase A and, and it, addressing those issues will be uh, the forefront here. Then we also highlight recent efforts, uh, papers being published um, that show the, the value or um, performance of different measurements. We like to highlight those and that is also on our website a list of recent CalVal uh, publications um, for people to, you know, not have to search through their Google Scholar or their research gate and find all the different products, uh, all the different papers that are out there. We try and uh, consolidate the different large scale efforts uh, for good reference and also promote the work that's being done among these. And uh, Another example of uh, the DOIs right in the lower right-hand corner there of an evaluation of Landsat 9, TERS 2 calibrations and LSD retrievals. And then as well, we try and promote and encourage uh, new CalVal sites to be developed. And as well, when we can get multiple uh, land product variables included at those sites, um, it, it is quite difficult to maintain these, um, and we need to, as a community, support these measurements as much as possible. Uh, one calls for letters of support, uh, one calls for inclusion and proposals and funding um, are, are quite necessary uh, in, in other parts of my job. Trying to maintain these networks uh, is, is a significant uh, duty. The operations and maintenance, maintenance costs of these networks um, can be considerable. If you consider, well, I put a station out somewhere and then it just runs uh, infinitely uh, is is certainly incorrect. And within my own world of soil moisture, we consider a network to be about five years long. 
And over that course of that five years, uh, the ship of the I think it's a ship of Theseus concept of the entire network has probably been replaced in five years, which means you don't you have an initial startup of a network, and then over the next five years, you will need to replace twenty percent of that network uh, on into the future because of uh, sensor failures, data logger failures, modem failures, damage, vandalism, theft. All of these things make networks uh, challenging to maintain. You're always in, always interrupted. Um, your data series can be interrupted quite frequently. Um, so how do we, another issue for me particularly has been how does this community support the maintenance of these um, stations that are often underfunded and or funded via just uh, short term um, validation studies if, if you're lucky, how do we keep them going long-term? Because long-term data records are really what we're looking for. The super sites have long-term data, uh, have long-term funding usually associated with them, um, but we'd like to see them grow because uh, those networks are generally generally not uh, designed for remote sensing CalVal. Uh, those some do, are, do have some uh, good features that do make them possible. Uh, to serve as fiducial reference measurements. Uh, here's some first validation from that site. Um, you can see information here, future processing. Emissivity estimation is the main area of improvement. Not everything's perfect. And um, you have your installation of the radiometer, another uh, a actual uh, below atmosphere measurement. Um, so when you have something of this level of effort, it is, it is significant, um, but it is a nice direct measurement versus a proxy measurement for the land product. Uh, and there, and there are recent the uh, those publications. Surface radiation. This has been a, a recent effort uh, that that's come to full uh, fruition uh, with Com with Copernicus, Copernicus Sentinel three. Well, CI will be based in a new input data, which improves geolocation mismatch, mismatch and validation is expected by the first quarter of 24, which we're in right now. And then the LAI FR a vegetation parameters and a preliminary va evaluation is going. Another thing that happens is we're looking towards consolidating these research uh, findings so that we have um, special issues, highlighting the work to get uh, going out there, and we try and um, encourage folks to contribute to those efforts, um, publication-wise, um, serving as a as a focal point for this. The um, more examples of, of CalVal, we always like our nice uh, forty-five degree angle plots, and we love it when those lines are nice and straight. I wish I had plots that looked as good as those. Um, but these are the things that help improve the public understanding of pub, the public understands a, a matchup plot like this, um, which makes they don't always understand the numbers or what, what the what the value of a MAD or an RMSE is, but they'll understand a good um, XY plot with uh, things falling along a line. So um, great about communications. Land service phenology, uh, more um, look at the different products that are available from Tropomi, SIF, uh, Modus NDVI. Uh, these are comparisons um, over different crop types and um, more crop types. So uh, I think that's the end of my um, the different sections of land products, but a few other things that we try and do with an LPV is encourage the development of field schools. Uh, we're all scientists that are usually working at a bench or at a computer or a keyboard, uh, but there are still scientists collecting this data on the ground. And as a part of good validate, a good practices protocol is the physical hands-on collection of data. Often, especially for the more difficult to measure um, parameters. So snow, for instance, uh, the snow community has a long history of uh, having field schools both in Europe and the US, I think both run uh, annually. 
uh, so the folks can get out and take measurements of, of snow. They combine it with validation um, when possible, but uh, educating the people who are going to use that data later on how this data is measured is collected in the field is very important. Um, and there is lots of support for, for some of these schools uh, and good attendance with um, usually on the order of 30, you can see at the bottom there, 30 or so slots of people just because of the size of, of the ability to, to house these folks in these conditions to, and then instruct them efficiently, um, many more applicants than slots in schools. Uh, I myself have hosted the soil moisture field schools uh, as well as network operators workshops. I'm trying to uh, bring together communities that measure these different things, soil moisture, soil temperature, and instances that would then be uh, go to the individual network operators who need to learn from each other uh, about how measurements are made because um, they each have their own application that they're trying to meet. Um, and if we can find a way to harmonize their measurements uh, and also make it more efficient to operate these networks, there's lots of uh, network operator, network operator uh, discussion happened that people learned the tricks of the trade along the way. These are not long-term employees. Generally, they're uh, maybe in position for five to 10 years, and then they move on and you lose that um, you lose that institutional memory. So trying to build that network out a little bit more so that memory uh, continues um, and can be passed from network to network. So there's more uh, of a backbone there for that fiducial reference measurement. Um, it is uh, one, of our, one of our goals. So the CalVal portal, uh, CIOS has their own CalVal portal as well that we're trying to make available. Uh, you can see here, um, that not everything is supported there and it's, it's tough to keep this going a little bit, but um, you can search at calvalportal.cios.org uh, and explore there. We have efforts from the producer reference measurements, soil moisture at least, and other FRMs for EO are ongoing. And we have individual uh, subject, uh, individual parameter networks or, or data archives that are working um, to, to bring together a harmonized data product for, for different groups like the ISMN. I think I will end on this slide, which is just a reminder of, of what we're trying to accomplish with this, uh, starting from an unverified satellite Earth observation, uh, going uh, adding in fiducial reference measurements, going through an online tool or, or a code repository, uh, being guided by good practices of documents, and producing validation reports and into comparisons to see how different products compare to each other, uh, not as an error, but as a difference, uh, to see how the um, use of different products can impact ultimate decision support tools or uh, actions that will be taken by agencies so that there's an understanding of why uh, one year one thing happened and the next year something different happened because they had a different input. Um, this is how we build public trust. This is how we uh, move forward with a broad uh, community effort that is, uh, unfortunately, uh, best efforts in many cases, but uh, we do our best. And I invite you to join any of our many mailing lists. We do not send out a lot of emails, um, but it's a way to keep uh, involved in the community if you go to our website. Um, again, just search LPV GSFC you'll find us and, and sign up for the website there or reach out to the um, focus area leads and they will be able to put you on the website, the, the listserv. And with that, I am done with my presentation and I can take questions. Um, so going to um, Jademi, Yumi, I'm gonna um, do the disservice of saying of mispronouncing your name. Uh, for the phonology group, is there a training opportunity for persons from Africa? African phonology and intricacies seem to be understudied the most. We make an effort to um, we make an effort. It's more on the European side uh, to engage with all continents 
um, as much as possible, but there are limitations. We can often get to, um, we're in many places, and I can't speak for phonology particularly, um, there's an effort to host both Western and Eastern, Hem Western and Eastern Hemisphere uh, meetings, um, kind of on a rotation. And there's certainly desire, possibly coordinating with WMO to get travel funds to get you up to uh, a meeting, say, in, in Europe from Africa it would be easier. Uh, we try to do that, but, but first we're trying to just organize our meetings on, on our own. <laughs> um, and then if possible, we, we can, can stretch out. Same with South America, Australia, um, and Asia. So for the next question, what are the challenges in capital of soil moisture at higher spatial resolutions, 10 meters or less? Uh, it's really the cost of um, the measurement and the consistency of that, as well as uh, it's actually somewhat easier when you're within 10 meters. Um, and this is true of many of the land and surface parameters. Um, it, if you can produce products that are subfield, once you have access to a field, you could make multiple measurements. You still need to um, multiply that by the number of landscapes you want to capture and validate within. Um, but, you know, it's easy for me to walk 10 meters and take another measurement. Um, so there's actually an advantage to that, but you do have to um, increase the number of landscapes you're trying to capture versus some of the larger scale 30 kilometer products that we would deploy networks, maybe 10 to 20 net stations across a larger domain. That's 20 different landowners versus one. But then capturing all the information um, at that scale can be can be a challenge. Um, what are the different strategies? There is a for us soil moisture high resolution using SAR. Same thing, being with being subfield measurements. You can do the same with with land surface temperature. Uh, vegetation is certainly also done with that. Above ground biomass is usually on the lidar scale of of, of line traces. So they can get it to tree scale. You're you're doing something that now you're you're measuring individual uh, footprints um, that you can fully cover that footprint. You don't have to worry as much about uh, random sampling within a domain. You could you could almost fully characterize these footprints, which is useful. Um, but then you need to multi you need to extend that out past you know a, what you can drive in one day, and you need to um, go to other con other countries to to other biomes. Uh, to to make sure that your measurements are are valid across the diversity of biomes in which it, that data might be used. Um, there are lots of stipulations on data that maybe not everyone reads. Um, for instance, with soil moisture, there's often uh, the products are L-band and they're limited to anything below five kilometers. Uh, five, five kilograms per square meter of vegetation water content is one of their stipulations uh, or, or flags. Uh, same thing with uh, freeze thaw. So these products are limited in, in their validation. They they can only uh, verify because they don't have the validation conducted at those other scales. And there's some other logistical issues um, that make those measurements difficult. When we access an EO data product, how do we ensure it is intercalibrated and can be used synchronously with EO products from other sources? Um, depending on that data product. So if you come from a, um, if you come from some, some efforts, depending on the, the F, so International Soil Moisture Network, for instance, um, they do some work to make that, make their products uh, harmonized or homogeneous across the, the diversity of measurements. The, there's a salval, uh, product that they, or or say the CCI products that they produce, they're trying to harmonize across these different data, data products. Um, there's lots of work to be done to make these harmonized products so that you may have consistent moments, uh, first, second, third order moments, at least. Um, it, is, it is always good to verify on your own how these products are um, validated and conduct and composed it's it, it's we're still early in, in time for many of our products 
um, unless you have a consistent um, unless you have a consistent funding source with a consistent uh, good practices or identical practices, um, it, it is, the intercalibration is is uh, up to the individual data producers or the users of that data. Uh, so the the community website where you can sign up, I have to pull, in, I have to bring up a different browser to grab that. I did two things. Uh, we always learn I've done two things wrong here. I did not actually post that website anywhere, and I did not show the um, the validation stage matrix that I thought I had in my slide deck, and it was not there. So uh, you live and you learn. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I'll see what I can do about bringing up. I'll stop my share and, and post in the other um, web, website links. Um, but Okay, thank you so much, Mike, for your talk. It was very interesting. Thank you for, you know, uh, be part of this GSEO uh, uh, webinar. Uh, GSEO is uh, the GLS Standards for Earth Observation Technical Committee. We have currently several working groups, including SAR, Hyperspectral, GNSSR, and several others. At the moment, we have uh, published the first standard of Genesis reflectometry, and we are growing, so uh, we are an active community. And we, we thank you for agreeing uh, to, to be here today. I have a couple of questions more for you. The first one is on Calvary activities for biomass. You mentioned the, you know, the, uh, the challenge for you know, uh, merging different biomass uh, data products, and I, I can imagine that it is so hard to to you know to to validate these products because you know uh, the difficult to, to to you know to install a carbon sensor in Amazon tropical forest etc. So can you elaborate a bit more on that on recommended practices and your own experience, please? For biomass or for um, biophysical? Uh, for biomass. Okay. So for biomass, they're they're generally particularly talking about above ground woody biomass. Uh, I have I'm more of a soil moisture uh, scientist. I have done this. Um, there's quite a few challenges. Uh, I would I would defer particularly they, there is a there is a good practices document is it is our largest uh, document and and probably most thorough on that website uh, for above ground woody biomass. It was published very recently. Um, by a fantastic group of folks, the the author list is quite long. Um, but when you when you start talking to foresters, um, again above ground woody, you're looking at uh, speciation. You're using allometric equations. You certainly don't want to necessarily harvest a whole forest uh, to to produce your estimate for biomass for for dry weight. Um, so they use allometric equations. Uh, as well as surveys. And the nice thing is they generally don't change very much. Um, okay. If you have constant stands, especially some of the um, LTERs in the US where you, or the neon sites where you can, you can have a forest inventory conducted and then you can measure the change in that inventory. So as your satellites fly over, you can see a subtle change in that biomass reading. Um, LIDAR from heights, um, you can take samples, you can take you can take um, leaf samples, uh, branch samples when when possible. I've done that myself, going into cherry pick or you know lifts into forest canopies to capture these things. It's it is intensive. Um, that there is a consistency, at least within the forestry, that you can make an inventory and it and it doesn't change very much. So it's not one day to the next you don't lose that knowledge. And some of our super sites have these very good data archives, even they have DEMs and, and LIDAR flights that you can always reference. Um, it's an interesting field. It's very challenging, but an interesting field. Okay, cool. Uh, my second question is regarding soil moisture content. Uh, you mentioned that at the moment, uh, we are using like data such as for SMAP or SMOS around 30, 40 kilometers of spatial resolution. <laughs> And the new challenge of, use, of using like uh, higher resolution products from NYSAR. I also to comment about the you know the the enhanced resolution of soil moisture product by Genesis reflectometry missions such as Cygnus, Spark Global, a future ISA hydrogenesis. The spatial resolution is around one kilometer, 
And I think that uh, um, this new data set uh, will be of high interest also to complement uh, nicer data. So um, I think that um, in the future, uh, the community should also explore this, this new uh, technique, the so-called GNSS reflectometry, uh, such as, as Cygnus. I don't know if you are familiar with that technique. So with, with Cygnus or any of the other um, Muon, Spire yeah. uh, products, they, uh, and they, they can, I don't know the numbers of every single one of those, but my, my recollection is that the, the native resolution of those footprints, uh, from Cygnus like satellites is like three by uh, maybe four kilometers by six to eight kilometers, the kind of smear on the ground. It's always important to understand what the, what the native resolution of these measurement devices is. Well, NISAR will be a five meter, but it's, it's SAR. So you need to, you know, there's a lot of noise in that. So you need to upscale. What they're doing with these passive instruments is they're downscaling and using information like Planet does with, with um, they'll produce, a, I think a one meter product or three, a three meter product, meter, not kilometer. I didn't say it wrong, meter. Um, I've seen those products produced. They're using information about the ground um, from optical satellites usually and knowledge and understanding of what of of what the broad accurate uh, passive microwave reading is and using the inferences about structure at the surface uh, to infer a higher resolution product the enhanced product from SMAP is a is a regridded product the footprint is still 33 kilometers but they've gridded it to nine then you add in some optical information now you can get it to three or one or sub one, you can go down to using MODIS, you can go down to 400 meter. Using Landsat, you can go to 30 meter. Um, the validation of those is not, in my opinion, uh, fully mature yet. Um, we're working there. It's hard to capture all of that. It's hard to get enough resources together to do a full effort. Um, when the satellites are flying uh, in a rigorous way, Usually you do a you do a site here and you do a site there. Um, there's there's not a, a large scale. There's not a sufficiently large scale effort yet to capture everything in a, a specific time frame um, to produce a confident product uh, across multiple landscapes. I think that in the future we should also think on data fusion for different sensors. For example, with SAR, I agree that we have. Uh, a good, very good spatial resolution, but the temporary resolution is is not, it can be improved. On the other hand, using signals or Spire or future other, you know, commercial data sets, uh, we will have a, a reasonable resolution around one kilometer, depending on the emission parameters, but the temporary resolution could be as good as ours. So I think that uh, using different type of sensors for some of your estimation will be interesting. And also I think that, for example, with this map, I agree that now they have, you know, released this enhanced uh, soil moisture product. Uh, but at least from my understanding, the data pointing is nine kilometers, but the spatial resolution is 20 kilometers. So I think that also we can, you know, add this, this, this product because uh, the spatial resolution is not great, the temporal resolution is better, but the accuracy in principle is, is very high. So I think that at the end, merging all of these different, you know, um, sensors uh, could be helpful. But in terms of validation, it is it is hard, I think. So in the future, probably uh, many people will be working on that. Yes, yes. Um, I'll, I'll mention, so within the US, especially within agriculture, but you go into the, the, the rangelands as well, you're, what we'd like to see, you want to start easy on a cowbell strategy. So you have a reference, you don't want topography, you don't want, but let's make it low vegetation, low topography, flat as could be, um, homogeneous, same soil texture if possible, um, so that you can eliminate all the other variables so that you can isolate, is my sensor accurate? And then you slowly start to introduce among your sites uh, the variables that would make it harder. Uh, when in the U S when you start talking in that one kilometer range, we have lots of agricultural fields that are an 800 meter field. And that's where it gets tough of 
well, you're not going to have a, you know, we don't have fields that are a kilometer. Um, maybe you get to the rangelands, you can have homogeneous kilometers, you know, hundreds of square kilometers even. Um, but when you get subfield at the NISAR scale, 200 meters, then you know that you have homogeneous pixels on the vegetation structure. For sure, you don't want to have mixed field uh, within your domain because then it's heterogeneous and, it, and it, you can have um, isometric uh, and anisotropic influences on your cow valve. That's, you know, we'd like to step in simple first and then add challenges on the ground side to then uh, dig into how the, the product behaves to those different platforms. So um, Landsat's 30 meter, we can we can we have plenty of locations with 30 meter homogeneity or or mostly homogeneity or mostly homogeneous. That's very interesting. Uh, we have more questions from the audience, please. I think the last one I didn't cover was can you elaborate on the wildfire cow strategies and active validation data set for analyzing wildfire? Um, so wild land fire, burned area, things like that. I would have to say um, from the fire. From our fire leads, um, they say it is a very difficult, that is probably the most difficult and challenging focus area we have um, because it is uh, thankfully not a widespread problem or or it is a widespread problem, um, but it's it's event-based, um, different from most of our other land products. You, you have to, getting pre and post is not something you can plan unless you're in the prescribed uh, domain. Um, we do, they are, hoping to eventually get to a data set or, or an archive of a data set, um, but it is very difficult. There's mostly studies um, in particular domains um, and they, I would reach out to those leads uh, in particular on the, on the, the fire burned area um, because they have a particular challenge. And we do, we recognize that, and they recognize that, that their community is, is somewhat small, but um, it is very dramatic. Uh, they're an important and difficult to, uh, to to provide validation data sets because often the variables we're interested in might be a taskable satellite and it's you can't have pre it's hard to have pre fire events unless you're prescribed so I didn't fully answer that but it's, I did answer the best I could <laughs> um and I don't see any more in the chat. So we don't have more questions. Just to thank again you, Mike, for, for being here today. It was a great talk. And congratulations for all the work that your group and you are, are doing. And so see you next time. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody.